I was born in Poland, Lodz. My name is Ivan Goldberg. I was the youngest of four siblings. I had three sisters. I was the only boy. My father was born in 1888. Uh, and at an early age of year 12, he joined all the socialist movement of the Bund. It was the Jewish socialist organization. And till the day he was murdered by the Nazis, by the Germans, in 1942. Out of uh, nearly 700,000 inhabitants, a third of the population of Lodz was Jewish. So it was a very vibrant Jewish community and all aspects of normal cultural, political life. And this came to an abrupt end with the outbreak of the war. With the outbreak of the war on the 1st of September 1939, it was a Friday, five o'clock in the morning, we could hear the first bomb fell on the lodge hallway yard. And this was the only bombing what occurred in Lodge. And only seven days afterwards, the following Friday, the Germans marched in into the city of Lodge. And of course, immediately, life changed completely. Also, law, what were implemented in Germany from 33 to 39, applied immediately to the Jews of Lodge. It meant that we were put outside the law. And uh, so I could, so I did drag us out, male or female, young or old, from the houses for all kinds of work, of course, without payment. And usually many did not return late in the evening. The one who returned were always black and blue for the beatings I received. We had to hand in all valuables. Firstly, all cameras and radios. It was not only uh, what Jews had to hand, and even Poles had to hand in radios. And of course, Jews were not allowed back to the places of employment. You, uh, synagogues were burned down. You see, in a, after a short while, we had to put on, they forced us to put on a yellow armband. Only way we could go out was through the wires. And those wires, wire, the barbed wire was guarded by the German Schutzpolizei. And those, those who guarded the, the ghetto very often did amuse themselves, took off the rifle and make men or women or a child a moving target. And so I just aimed and shot. Many people were murdered that way. Once we were enclosed in the ghetto, life became impossible. The hunger was so great. In 1940, in the middle of 1940, the Bund organized the first protest, and people went out into a demonstration in ghetto. A few people were wounded, and we realized immediately that if we would dare again to openly protest and we realize the consequences will be too great, so we abandoned this part of our resistance. Everything had to be done in a different way. Our resistance had to be different. So as we called it at the time and today, it's a passive resistance. And our passive resistance meant to encourage the Jews of the ghetto to hold out. 
So after 1941, when schooling was forbidden, so we organized schooling for children as long as they were in ghetto, in small groups. We organized reading groups. We collected books in small libraries, what was everything, every illegal work was under the threat of death. Not only for the person who will be caught, but families and much more, because the Nazis employed collective responsibility. And so uh, we organized those reading groups, we read the books, we discussed those books, we organized recitals, theatrical plays, our cultural life. And as long as I didn't kill us physically, we never contemplated to in giving up. Before 1942, when there was the biggest action in ghetto, it was called the Gesperre. I've lost my entire family then. And as far as I remember, around 50. Cousins, uncles, grandparents, aunties. So I was left with my mother. Before the liquidation of the Lodge Ghetto, I was left with my mother. I was then only with my mother. And I, as I was in the underground, and I was from the people who knew, who, who were, were in the know what's happening to us, I went into hiding and I was able to hide out for four weeks. And after four weeks, my mother, she was in her early 50s, couldn't take it any longer because I prepared some hiding places beforehand in attics, in bunkers, concealed, of course. And we sometimes had to change those hiding places on the run. And my mother wasn't capable of doing it any longer. She was emaciated, physically very weak, and she came out with a proposition that I should go on hiding and she will present herself for deportation. I couldn't let my mother go on her own. I was 19 years old at the time, and I did think that maybe when we arrive and I knew where we're going, to Birkenau, to Auschwitz, I will be able to help my mother. But of course, it was to no avail. On arrival, immediately on arrival, when those heavy doors were flung open, in the scream of the SS, everybody out, men on one side, women on the other side, women and children on the other side, and those precious moment, my mother was able to tell me that, Abram, you should do everything humanly possible to survive. And when you will survive, wherever you will be, wherever you will find yourself, you should tell people what was happening to us and what was done to us. Because by knowing, people will be able to prevent that anything like this will never happen again to anyone. And only a short while afterwards, I lost the last member of my family in the guest chambers of Birkina. When I was driven to the bar, I was allowed only my shoe and my belt. If your shoe were too good, it was taken away and you were given wooden clock. Fortunately, I had very good shoes and those shoes were not taken away. And this is particularly Later on, it, it kept me warm for all, for all the next nine months. And I was there for over three months. And as I always say, I was in hell for three months. You can imagine when you saw 24 hours the chimneys of the crematoriums belching out smoke, the chimneys of, it was terrible and you could smell the burning flesh because if the crematorius couldn't cope, so I burned the people on pious. So I usually made with us gymnastics. I said for our goods, 
And usually I choose a day where it was raining, it was very muddy. And so I made with us for an hour or more. We couldn't tell the time, but to us it did it, it sound like an eternity. And you can imagine we had to sit down, push ups, and sometimes side they even side ask us to take off the belt and spread it across our our hands and any belt who fell off will be will, will be uh, beaten up. So and this is what happened. How can when you have a belt across you, a leather belt, it had to fall off. So it, so it's a, one who was unlucky and he picked he had a beating uh, sometime to death. Uh, and then, well, on a couple of occasions, well, we had line to line up, so I again choose a couple of hundred, and supposed to be work. Work, it wasn't actual work. So, so I made us carry stones from one end to the other, on the run, for many hours. And for anybody who fell behind, I clubbed to death. Well, my survival is now three Jewish generation. Ourself, my children, and my grandchildren. We all should remember that we all belong to the same human race, to human race. No difference of the color of our skin, or the shape of our eyes, or our ethnic or religious background. What hurts one human being hurts also another. And you should always respect, always respect other people with what are a bit different than yourself. Hitler came to power on those pretenses and on those racial discriminat discriminative slogans that of a superior race. No one of, uh, no one of us is superior to another human being. We are different, but not superior.